everybody. Good evening. I am your host of tonight's webinar, Dr. Jed Appleruth, talking to you about math anxiety. And it's a topic that many of you know. Some of you might even have math anxiety. And uh, I work with many students who are uh, a little bit afraid of math, a little bit afraid of, of not doing well. Are they math people? Are they not math people? It's something that, uh, you know, it's actually pretty prevalent. Or it's one of those things where in our society, it seems to be more acceptable to say, I'm not, not a math person or, or, or I hate math. You rarely, be, you know, I, I hate English. I hate speaking. I hate writing. But we hear a lot more of, of fear and anxiety around math and science. And actually at Apple Ruth, we do a lot more tutoring for kids who need help with math and support with math. I think it's a societal thing, um, definitely in our, in our culture. I think before we begin, uh, sometimes we do a quick poll or a survey. Let me see if that's coming up. All right, so this is a quick one. It's literally 20 seconds. Are you a student, a parent, and, um, an educator? Uh, do you have a student in high school, middle school, elementary, um, who is on the talk, call tonight? Do you need any help from, from Apple Ruth? Test prep, academic tutoring, or coaching for uh, EF coaching? And then finally, do you want us to reach out? Yes, no? And we are done. That is all it is. It's a few questions and we're rocking and rolling. Uh, tonight, we're going to make sure we send you a copy of the uh, recording. We're going to have a recording. And we'll send you a durable link. So if you want to watch any part of this again, if you want to slow it down and look at a slide I, I covered, it'll be available uh, in the recording. And we're going to have time tonight for Q&A. At the end, I always like a robust question and answer session. It helps me uh, figure out what what parts were resonated, which, which parts landed, what parts are confusing. Hopefully it's not too confusing and uh, hopefully it's more enlightening and illuminating and, uh, but we'll find out. So let's, let's jump into it. So math anxiety, thinking about math anxiety, that, let's, let's dive in. So you may have heard a student or a spouse or a colleague say, I hate math or math is pointless or math is terrible or I'm not a math person. There are definitely folks who do not feel very confident or efficacious, and often that translates into a lack of interest or a hidden that the area. Um, if someone who's really, really good at math, they rarely say math is terrible if they're, they're talented in that area. Um, and culturally, it's interesting. Sean Balak, she was a big researcher in Chicago. Now she's the head of a major school. I think, I don't know if it's Vassar. It's, it's a very strong school. But she was saying, you don't hear people talking, like bragging about how they can't read or they hate reading, um, but it's more acceptable to say, I don't like math, I hate math, I can't do math. Um, that, that's more embraced societally. So that's interesting. It's talking about you know math and how we perceive it and having anxiety and negative feelings about it, negative thoughts about math. Now, anxiety, generally, it's and you're sensing there's fear ahead, there's threat ahead, there's danger ahead. And in a similar fashion, math anxiety, you're worried about, am I gonna be able to do math? I see math. Do I have the chops, the skills, the resources, or is it going to be a threat and actually hurt me in some capacity? So, and, and people who are more prone to general anxiety often are more prone to math anxiety. There is a correlate there, um, for sure. And some anxiety, and and part of it is how do you how do you want to frame it? One of my colleagues, Gary Glass, talks about. He's at Emory. Talks about. Do we want to call everything anxiety, or says I have some stress, or I have some worry. I'm worried about this this math test coming up versus I have anxiety. And you know, anxiety can be a condition that's you no know, pathological. There's impaired function, and so the way Gary would frame it, in a way, this is the year he's Dotson curve. It's over 100 years old. Looking at when you have some stress, it's actually a really good thing. And thinking about this, without stress, we wouldn't achieve very much. We wouldn't accomplish very much. We'd never rise to an occasion. Uh, when things are on the line, things matter. We have some stress, and that's okay. Uh, you can even have some repetitive thoughts, a little bit of you know disruption of thinking, and that's actually fine too. So some stress is perfect. And this, this curve tells you that as stress levels go up, you hit a certain point of maximum performance. So if you don't care, if there's no stress, no fear, no arousal, no anxiety, you don't do your best. And so you need a certain level of, oh, this really matters. I got to focus. Um, this counts to hit, hit your top performance. However, too much stress, too much arousal, too much anxiety, and performance declines. And if you're on this webinar, you're more thinking about that side of the, of the curve. There's, you know, there's so much stress, so much arousal, anxiety that suddenly the, the kids aren't performing as well, and they're they're freezing, they're locking up, not doing as well, they're freaking out, they're having real hardship. 
So too much stress is problematic. So again, the language is from my, my colleague, Gary, a psychologist. It's like, you know what? Is it natural stress? I'm stressed about this math test or I have really functionally limiting, I have problematic anxiety. And we bandy about the term anxiety, same way we throw around the term of I'm OCD. And it's, it's one thing, there's less of a stigma for mental health issues. I have anxiety that's more accepted and especially post-pandemic. There's been a lot of talk about anxiety and you know you can't read an article um, and you know, once a month, there's gonna be something about men, teens mental health. Um, there is a problem going on now. And I think it's more than just labels and losing the stigma. I think things have actually changed for our young people. Um, but definitely there's a question above, are we overly pathologizing something? I'm worried about my, my math test versus I have math anxiety. So be mindful about that language in our discourse. I have people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm manic. Like, are you really manic? That, that's actually a clinical term. Um, OCD, is, these are clinical terms but we use them often very, very openly interchangeably. And sometimes it's made better to dial down some of our language because our language can affect our behaviors and perceptions. So words matter. That was from Gary, you know, he's, he's a head of counseling over at Emory. Like words, words are words matter. So when it comes to too much arousal, too much stress, too much anxiety about that, it affects people both physiologically, especially kids who are younger, have more physical, my tummy hurts, I have a headache, I'm sweating, my heart's beating, Emotionally, I'm having worry, anxiety, cognitive issues, and then behavioral changes. I, I have put off this thing I don't want to face. I delay starting it. I procrastinate. I, I may skip, uh, you know, if I have a quiz or a test and we not go. Um, that's good behavioral changes. So young people, it's more physical. Um, it's more, they, they somaticize their arousal there. And as they get older, it's more effective, emotional, and, and behavioral. Um, and, and so ultimately the question is, how does math anxiety, how does it show up, math arousals, math stress? And typically it's going to be a series of experiences over time. They impact our perception, the schema of math. Am I good at math? Am I bad at math? My, my notions of self-efficacy, am I good at this? Can I perform or am I nervous? Is math a threat? Additionally, we're influenced by attitudes, perceptions from our peers, from our families, our parents. We'll talk more about parents, from our siblings, and from society in general. Um, one of my colleagues talked about, we, we live in a society where math is hard, is more acceptable than reading is hard. Um, there's more of a sense of, you know, math isn't for everyone. And that, that's not cross-cultural. There are other cultures or societies where that's not so accepted, where math is simply what we do. Math is part of, you know, it could be the Finns and Norwegians, could be the, the East Asians, where that's, it's not a cultural thing to say, math, we're not good at math. Um, and there's research that math anxiety tends to increase um, as math, uh, as there's more, more at stake, and there, there are more assessments in the fourth grade. Often you see more at the beginning of math anxiety among young children, and then it peaks in middle or high school um, as math assessments are higher. And often people who are very math averse will make different choices in college and probably not take many math classes. But in high school, you have to, you're required, um, that's part of graduation requirements. Um, and uh, Jo Bowler, um, I think I'm saying her name right, hopefully. She's a great author. I mentioned a few of her books later on. Uh, it's her quote, early anxiety snowballs, leading to math difficulties and avoidance that only gets worse as kids get older. So the math avoidance, that's really the, the key part of this. Um, there's performance, am I getting an A or a B? But then there are choices you make about what math track, what math classes, and then what careers, and then how much money you make. And things like that. I mean, ultimately, do I avoid certain whole career tracks because I'm nervous about my math abilities? And uh, and towards the end, I have about 15 to 20 slides about um, math anxiety and, and, st and STEM and gender. Uh, there are some differences in terms of females selecting out of STEM-based careers and majors because of some sense of, I'm not good at math. We'll talk more about that. that that's an interesting talk. Um, and so there are students who get math anxiety who are just naturally more inclined to it. Um, kids who have higher anxiety in general tend to experience more anxiety in mathematics. Uh, students who have a prob problems with processing speed, they work more slowly, can experience problems with, do I, am I fast enough for this math class? And students who have learning differences, so dyscalculia, um, dysgraphia, reading problems, dyslexia, there's reading in, you know, in, in math. Um, and so, but time is often a big one I see where kids who are slower, feel more pressure about math. And these are the big ones. It's processing speed, my difference is, and then and skill deficits. If for whatever reason, you didn't have good exposure to math instruction, um, it could be pandemic induced. It could be you went to a school where math really wasn't strong 
and then you were thrown to a school where suddenly they expect you to be here and you're here, in and of itself, that can stimulate and generate some anxiety. Because if you feel like I don't have the abilities, I wasn't trained well enough, then I'm going to be nervous. Um, and so that, you know, sometimes that, that, that nerves is actually grounded and yeah, you didn't have the training. And so you have to, you know, have some remediation in some cases, some support, some scaffolding, some tutoring, um, when you are in fact behind your, your grade level. Um, and when it comes to anxiety, this is a general rule psychologically, if you perceive something as a threat, this is going to hurt me, this might hurt me. That's when there you get anxious. That's when you begin to have some symptoms and arousal and so forth. But this perception of this is a threat to me, that's really subjective and that can be changed and modified. And, you know, we can work on that. Whenever someone feels like this is a threat, a phobia, that, you know, you can reduce that. And that's part of what counselors do and therapists do. Um, so uh, there was, uh, pardon me, I had a uh, sneeze, which I just swallowed. That one went away. Uh, there was research at Stanford. I think it was around 2011, 2012. Um, Vinod, uh, Vinod Menonj, one of the researchers, they were putting kids and fMRI machines, functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, looking at their brain, looking at activation patterns of where is the blood flowing in the brain, where is it where things are lighting up. And they were giving kids exposure to math problems. Here's a math problem. And they were watching the parts of the brain that light up. And there are part, certain parts that respond like to phobias and fear, which were lighting up when they saw the math exposure. So this really is a phobic response. They see math and they get afraid the same way as you see a snake and you have that similar kind of your body pulls back as a fear. Um, and so, and the amygdala is the part of the brain. It's in the, the you know, the meso, the, the, the limbic part of the brain. It's not the frontal cortex, a little behind, a little bit older uh, part of the brain um, that's looking for threats. And some people, they see math, they, the, the amygdala starts to activate. It's because this might hurt me. Um, and so in Chicago, Sean Baylock, I mentioned her earlier, she's a researcher who wrote a great book called Choke about performance anxiety. And, and she writes about math anxiety. They were doing research on kids. Once again, they were throwing kids into these fMRI machines, which is a pretty common way of looking at what the brain is doing. It's pretty basic right now, but it's what we have to work with. And they were finding that um, the dorso posterior insula and the uh, mid cingulate cortex, just parts of the brain, parts of the midbrain below the cortex, um, these, these parts are lighting up. Um, these, these are active, you know, these are emotional pain. Um, and so students who are, have report high math anxiety, again, they give them a math problem to queue up some math. And the part of the brain that's the most pain, like, you know, burning your hand was lighting up. So it's interesting. So physiologically, there's a, you know, it's not just I'm nervous, but now I'm, I'm, I'm sensing pain by looking at math. That's pretty wild. But um, so it shows you that this really is a physiological thing as well for these kids. Um, also, in terms of what's happening when kids have math anxiety, sense that you know cortisol, the stress hormone, turns up, and then your working memory, your ability to hold different things in your mental, you know, mental store decreases. So I can't remember the instructions. I forget what I just read. And then additionally, um, when you're worried about, oh gosh, I might screw this up. Oh gosh, what could the consequences? What if I fail this test? those kind of thoughts squeeze out thoughts about the task. So you have obstruction and then you have lower working memory. And then suddenly you can't, you know, recall things that you once knew. Um, and so again, stress hormone goes up, your memory goes down, performance goes down. And so here's a cycle of uh, the way Ken Shores conceived this. So when you have math anxiety, what's going on? So you, it starts off, you have anxiety and then you might avoid math, the avoidance pattern. I might put in less effort, I'm nervous, but I might do. If you avoid, or if you don't put in less effort, you may develop gaps in your skill. Now you're on a shakier foundation. Do I really know the content? And then, so my skill gaps increase. As I get to harder and harder math, these gaps become more problematic. As this, you know, now I'm struggling more, I become more anxious, I feel less efficacious. And then there's more math avoidance, can I avoid? And so this, there's a cycle, and some of you may recognize that suddenly it's like, let me avoid math at all costs. But also this can happen, it can affect your course selection as you get towards upper high school and college, but also career selection. I might avoid this test or this job opportunities. I'm not, I'm not good, I'm not, I'm not a math person. And you're sort of pigeonhole and limit yourself and limit your life. Um, and so this can affect you academically, professionally, financially, uh, and personally. I may avoid activities, things which I know I need to do or that my taxes, whatever, I'm not a math person. I have to outsource all this and I'm trusting you I can't read this contract. I can't read this thing. I'm not a math person. 
Um, and suddenly you're, there's a whole world to you that's closed off because you aren't a math person. Um, and so we don't want to have our kids limited. Who wants limitations? This makes your world smaller. We want to have worlds that are bigger and larger. And the nice thing is, again, psychologically, um, educationally, we can reduce math anxiety. Um, it's a process. There's not a one-off, I wave a wand and your math anxiety is gone. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over a series of events and, and thoughts and beliefs which formed. We have to change beliefs. And at Apple Ruth, part of our work is we change people's beliefs. We change their performance, their lives. So the whole thing is, can we shift um, self-belief and ability belief about mathematics? Um, and ultimately, there are many interventions. I'll mention a few tonight. We only have an hour. Uh, I, can, I could probably talk for many, many hours about this topic. Um, and one of the things you can do as parents is help and as educators, teachers, is dispelling the, you know, some of the myths about mathematics. There are more faulty beliefs about math. These dichotomous, like, I'm a math person. Math isn't really a thing. Math is a skill, and I can cultivate the skill. I can get better. Like, you know, I can get better. There's definitely a level of interest. Some kids are intrigued by certain things and puzzles, but part of it, that interest comes from it, my sense of I, I'm going to be able to do this. Self-efficacy beliefs fuel interest, and it's all tied together. Um, but the idea that they're, someone's just not a math person is nonsense. They haven't been given the skill, the training, the competence versus like my brain can't do math. Um, and then also there, there are myths that certain groups are natively better or worse. Um, and there's a whole thing about stereotype threat. And I'm worried that my group may not be as good as your group. Um, and if you make that stereotype salient, then I might, you know, kind of slink down. Um, and it could be about, you know, certain groups of people or for East Asians are better at math. They score higher. They're more, you know, our group isn't as good at math, X, Y, Z. Um, there, there's a sense that um, if I'm not fast, if I can't do it really quickly, I'm not good at math. It's nonsense. Now, as math gets more advanced, speed means nothing. And wrote, you know, it's more deeper in processing and understanding versus I'm a lightning fast person. Um, there's a false idea that if you make mistakes in math, you're not good at math, that experts don't make mistakes, which they absolutely do. And there's also that if something is hard, then either you're not good at it or you're doing it wrong. Uh, and we'll talk about that, especially with gender differences in terms of perceptions of math. And if I'm not immediately great, then I'm not, I'm not made for this, which is really a problematic belief. So these are these are myths, and these are these are problematic myths because they change. You know, this is perception. If, I, if I'm not fast or easy to make mistakes, I'm not a math person, which is garbage. And I, we have you know PhDs of math, and like no, they make mistakes. Um, and so these are just faulty, broken beliefs. Um, and this is a mathematician uh, talking about this guy who has a math degree, he's a math teacher, uh, and he does math for a living. And he says, let's let shift some things. One, as a math person, I, I I'm not going to get the answer on the first try. That isn't a thing for math, you know. I can tolerate a lot of frustration. And that's part of it. If kids feel frustration, like, well, I must not be good at math. Um, and the other thing is there isn't just one right way. If I'm doing math, I'm gonna be hit from multiple angles. And that's what people are good at math too. Let me try this way, didn't work, try this way, didn't work, try this way. Um, if I'm good at math, if I'm a math person, I check my work. It's not just, you know, you don't do it in pen. I make mistakes, I make careless errors, I'm gonna check it. And then I, I, I practice persistence. When there's frustration, I go forward. I don't give up when it gets hard. Um, and so all these things change. And, and the biggest perception shift is frustration is normal and healthy. It means you're on the right track, not it means you're not built for math. And that's a huge reframe. That's where kids hit a little frustration. We have to increase students' frustration tolerance. That's some distress, some, some stress, so, you know, it's not easy. That's part of what math, uh, that's what being good at math looks like. That's what being good at computer science looks like. I, I, I watch computer scientists and I keep hitting walls, try this way, try this way. And these people are amazing, but they don't, there's no belief that if I'm having a hard time coding this, I'm bad at, I, I'm at coding. That's nonsense. But again, if you're a novice at this, you might think that's not the truth. So helping kids realize some frustration, some mistakes, some trying different angles is part of what it means to be good at math. That's a huge insight for kids who think, if it's hard, I must not be good at this. Let me do something else. Let me do anything but math. Now for teachers, this is not, I don't know how many teachers are on this webinar. Uh, part of it is trying to minimize anxiety formation and being careful about how much you use competition in a classroom and someone's right, someone's wrong. Uh, minimizing group pressure and performance, get up to the board and do the math thing versus you know forcing people to be and make mistakes. Watching time pressures if you can, making it less about speed 
and also always avoid embarrassing kids uh, for you know in, in life in general avoid embarrassing students period um now self-talk is a big part of this because again anxiety and self-talk go hand you can't give a talk about anxiety without looking at the what are you telling yourself because anxiety is fueled by inner messages there's also biochemistry and cortisol and stress hormones but those are activated by your internal dialogue and uh, self-talk so part of it is teaching kids that you know when you have negative self-talk limiting self-beliefs um, you, know, you can work on that. You can change that. That's, that's the heart of cognitive behavioral therapy. You can shift your thoughts and that then shifts your behaviors and shifts your performance. So your inner dialogue is fueling anxiety. What you're telling yourself it matters. Your inner critic matters a lot. Learning how to become better at that is, is really important to talk about that. One of the things is you may hear a student say a global generalized statement, I'm bad at math. And immediately, if you're a parent, if you're a tutor, if you're a teacher, you've got to put that to bed immediately. We can't have that. Um, you know, that kind of thinking is just destructive and is false. Um, you know, I'm bad at words. I'm bad at what? Like, no, 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 no. We can get better, at, you know, or historically, I've not performed as well at math, but I can get better. I can improve. Again, it's the Carol Dweck's big work in the about 2008 fixed mindset growth mindset. We know now there's so much evidence behind this. It, it matters a lot. And fixed mindsets are just very destructive. Um, they're very limiting and they keep you from, you know, ex experiencing your full potential. So if, whenever you hear someone say, I'm bad at blank, start poking holes. Was there ever a time? Look for disconfirmatory evidence. Are you bad at every, have you ever been good at math? Do you ever do well? And, and I never let people write it off to, well, that was an easy class or that was an easy teacher or X, Y, Z. It's no, 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 no. You were good in that context. You've had challenges in other contexts, but to me, the idea that you are just inherently limited here, I don't believe that or accept that. And I make students often say, are you willing to accept the possibility that you could do better in math? Are you willing to you know, engage the possibility that, that there could be a better path versus just, I'm not good at this and I'll never be good at this? Because that kind of belief, honestly, is poison. And for an educator, I don't let that slide ever. And as parents, I recommend also hooking holes in those generalizing beliefs like that. Um, priming your inner coat. So part of the self-talk piece, we have an inner critic, which says, you're not good at this. There's an inner coach, which says, you can, you can do this, you've got this. And wanting, the more you reinforce that inner coach, that inner voice, which is a little bit separated from you psychologically, that becomes an ally and a resource. And that, that can fuel your really good self-talk. And the self-talk determines your, how long you stick with problems, how you handle frustration. When you come to a challenging thing, do you give up? What you're telling yourself is an impact whether I give up or whether I try different strategies and, and, and you know get cognitive flexibility and creativity. So your messages that are happening internally determine behavior. That's why they matter so much. Um, there's a guy, Ethan Cross. He's up in Michigan, psych um, psychologist. He's great. He wrote a great book called Chatter, which I have and I often reference in my books. Because and one of the he has like 25 interventions for working on your self-talk for anxiety and everything else. He talks about the importance of you statements. So you tell yourself you know, um, Ethan, you've got this, you can do this, you've got this math problem, don't give up, you put, you know, put work into this thing, and you're practicing self-kindness, but shifting away from, I've got this, I can do it, and he says there's psychologically a bigger benefit and a change in outcomes when you do you statements, that's one of his, like, one of his many tricks for working on your self-talk, talking from you know, the third person, you've got this, Jennifer, you've got this, um, all right, another little thing is in terms of motivation orientation, you want to always shift towards you're going towards an outcome. I want to get an 85 on this math test um, versus that's a, that's a approach orientation versus a failure avoidant is I don't want to fail this calculus quiz, um, which has a negative thing, which fuels more negative self-talk, more anxiety, more fear, more negative arousal. So you always be working to, you know, a, Julia, you've got this, you can do this, and you know we, we can get that 85 versus you're not going to fail. So whenever you activate this thing about you know not wanting to fail, avoiding an outcome, um, it, it ends up being less effective at motivating and less effective at actually changing outcomes. So you want to have an approach orientation. Um, you always want to be thoughtful about your kids. If they're saying negative things, I never do well on this, I always do bad, you know, check that. And again, always, never. You're more, you know, in certain contexts, like, did you prepare for this one? Or always, no matter what, ever in history, it's like that, then you often poke holes, make them question their over generalization. That's a, that's a major cognitive behavioral move. 
Um, one of my tutors, uh, John, he had one of his students taking the ACT and she texted him, check it out. I'm officially not stupid. He is, hooray, math went down though. Well, so we'll have a lot to go over, exciting stuff. I got a 30, so I'm pumped, but I'm officially not. <laughs> and so whenever you hear a kid say, I'm an idiot, I'm so stupid, I'm just bad at never gloss over that. Uh, you know, you have to be, be listening because again, this, this is gonna affect them for years and probably decades. If they're running around with these massive negative blocks and self-limiting beliefs, they, they become these monolithic things, which are gonna affect their lives. Um, so challenge them, question them, say, hey, is it, you know, saying you're an idiot, uh, I don't agree with that. And in this case, you made a mistake. Let's track back why you made a mistake. Was there an error in this and this? How you set the problem up? But I'm so stupid. I never let my kids say that ever. Uh, and that's just a rule for me. I don't want to have them you know, fighting for their limitations like that. Not helpful. Um, now, Sean Balock, I mentioned her great good work. Her and her colleague um, Ramirez did this good work um, doing and a basic, simple intervention, writing about your anxiety. Um, so writing about math anxiety, um, you know, I'm worried I'm going to have a, a bad outcome on a test. I'm worried writing about it increases metacognition, self-awareness, and ups performance. And part of it, the expressive writing, um, like writing on the positives, I've, I've done my homework, I'm prepared for it. It may help you regulate your emotions. It may free up working memory by getting rid of these circular thoughts when you put it in writing. And so, you know, expressive writing, there is definitely a place for it and it takes 10 minutes. So if you have a kid who's grappling with anxiety about math, have them write about that, have them take a minute, talk to them and then have them write about it. Um, there's a, a fun thing about reappraising arousal. Um, this is part of, in Baylock's book on choke, um, of when people have bad performances. And one of the things is there's a slight shift that there's a very little difference between being excited and being a little bit nervous the way the body responds. And there's a whole thing about, you know, there's a, the, the boss was talking about um, Bruce Springsteen when his early career when he was playing, you know, big, big shows in New York. And he was selling out, you know, the uh, big theaters. And he could, uh, the first year or two, he'd get up there, his stomach was turning and he was sweating, his heart beating. And he'd get out there and play and play a great set. Then about a year or two, and he's like, oh, wait a minute. It's not that I'm nervous, it's that I'm excited. And the body, it's very similar. And it's like, oh, it's called a reappraisal, a reframe of arousal. Um, there are many ways to interpret arousal. And so it's not a threat. This is just, you know, it's an opportunity to challenge. Um, and so part of it, and there's also some research, Harvard researcher, Allison Brooks said, when you reframe, reappraise, my heart's beating, I'm only my, you know, a little bit of activity. Because the same thing, when you're excited, when you're a little nervous, there's a little bit of higher cortisol, there's a little norepinephrine, a little stress hormone to get you ready for performance. Um, and so you can tell yourself, I'm excited when their heart's beating fast versus I'm anxious. And people who told themselves, I'm excited when their hearts are going, they actually perform better on hard math tasks. So that's a little interesting thing to reframe what's happening physiologically. It's called reappraisal of arousal, but there's evidence to support that actually can help you in math. That's kind of cool. Uh, the body, whenever I talk about anxiety, you have to work with the body because the body and the mind, and the, it's all connected, as we now know. Um, one thing I do for kids who have anxiety, I do something uh, very basic. Um, if you want to Google tapping, uh, Nick Ortner, there's a bunch of, you know, go on YouTube, type in tapping. Also type in, you can type in the emotional freedom technique. It's so simple. It's, it's, it's free and simple. I, I have kids do this before math test. And all they're doing is you're tapping certain points. And what you do, you tap your hand seven at a time. You say this, this math anxiety, this math anxiety. I want to reduce, you know, um, this math anxiety. And then you tap the point, you tap your eyebrow seven times, you tap the outside of the eye seven times, you tap under the eye seven times, under the nose seven times, chin seven times, collarbone seven times, under your armpit. And every time I do this, my body relaxes. And there's a whole thing about touch and, and anxiety. I, I have a talk coming up on the 31st about anxiety, but this one, it's a very simple intervention that some kids say this really helps them. It also has been shown to, to reduce anxiety with people, people with PTSD and more veterans. There's something to tapping. Breathing, we know that diaphragmatic breathing, which simulates the vagus nerve, what it does is it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, part of the autonomic nervous system, and which calms down your body. So deep diaphragmatic breathing, it slows down, like, you know, respiration changes, 
it changes your blood pressure. It calms every, you know, the vasodilation and all this good stuff happens when you're doing deep diaphragmatic breathing. So if someone's getting worked up with anxiety, get a hold of yourself and do some slow, deep hold breathing and showing kids how to do this and teaching kids how to breathe and breathe four counts, hold it, four counts out, hold it. And repeating it helps them managing. So there are many ways to manage anxiety, cognitive approaches, physiological approaches, and it's all beneficial. Parents, if you're on this, you're, most of you are parents, you have kids who are nervous about math. So you have a, a role to play here, a big role to play. Um, and part of it is that perceptions matter. And there's some very fascinating research that a kid's mathematical confidence and self-efficacy is more tied to parents' perceptions and parents' expectations than to the student's own actual achievement or um, actual ability or the attitude of a single teacher. So parents, your belief about math and your belief about you know, what math means it is really a big deal. Um, and math anxious parents can give that to their kids. Um, and it's actually interesting that math anxious parents who end up working with their kids and helping them on homework, the kids end up doing worse because the kids internalize that sense of math is hard. I'm not good at math. Um, and so never ever tell your kids, I'm not a math person either. That kind of framing, that kind of belief is infectious and not helpful. So part of it is do your own work first if you wanna help your kids. Learn to manage your own negative beliefs around math. Otherwise your kids will pick it up on it. So do you watch your own self-talk? Don't pass on your own fears in this area. Um, you wanna be encouraging. There's a research that parental encouragement influences students' perceptions and attitudes about math. Um, tell your kids you believe in them, you believe they can achieve this, and accomplish this. Um, give supports and scaffolds. And if you, if you can't help them with homework, it's fine. But if you have a, there's a mistake, you know, admit it, say I need some help on this one versus I'm just bad at math. So reframe a, a mistake because mistakes are perfectly normal. But let, let's go on YouTube, let's go on Khan Academy. let's find someone, find some, some, some help on this one. Talk to your kids about their math anxiety. So if, they, if a kid says, I'm, I'm nervous about this, talk to them, what's going on? When did this start? How does it show up for you? Be candid. So you know what? I have anxiety about X, Y, or Z. I, I get it. And here's what I do. Talk to your kids, be, be forthright, candid. I'll help normalize it for them. Um, when they're doing, they're working hard, praise the hard work and say, your yeah, mistakes are okay. You made some mistakes. It's part of the process, part of learning. It's how we learn through mistakes. Um, if you can demonstrate that, you know, there's math everywhere. It can start looking, at, let's add this up together. This, you know, before I pull my calculator out, let me try it first, a mental math, counting, you know, looking at a trend. If this continues at double the rate, just, you know, try to bring some math and make, show them that math isn't some academic concept in a book, but math is part of life. Um, math is part of finance. Math is part of look, looking at this interest rate we're paying on this credit card, looking at college and expenses and discount rates. Um, and stats are everywhere. I'm looking at, you know, looking at how this, this poll and what's the margin of error, what does that mean? Talking about math to the kids. Um, and when you're baking, looking at part, fractions of recipes, measuring hobbies, can even, you know, there are games. My, my dad plays Sudoku or Ken Ken. There are things, and there are plenty of, you know, uh, games online and study island and math activities, math games um, that are available. So to make math a little bit fun, a little bit light, very low pressure to make math part of your day, part of your life, not just in the textbook you only see when you're in school. Um, and so normalizing math, engaging them, looking for activities and talking about how math, you know, can affect their, their career. Math and science is part of everything. I like talking about science, talking about what's happening. Um, with my kid, I, thought I talk about science all the time. She's only two, but still I'm talking nonstop, you know, about the world, where the world works. And eventually as she gets older, I ask more questions and engage with them. And the more you know, you know, the more you can engage with them and show them how there's math everywhere in careers and activities and so forth. Um, practice, the way you do math actually matters. Um, you wanna space things out that can help lower anxiety levels, but the, um, minimize time pressure, getting more time. When student, people see math on a regular, on a daily basis, first only every other day, if they have a block schedule, do a little math all the time. It's like exposure, focus production, starting early, not waiting till the end, well, less time pressure. So uh, how you practice matters. Mentally warming up, if there's a big math lift, start up a little easier, get your get in the, in the math gear, warming yourself up. And you want to break things into smaller pieces, achieve mastery. When there's a big math, you know, let me go to the basic level and build and show my understanding before I go to harder and harder concepts. Um, get better at getting help when kids are anxious. Are they good at recruiting support? Um, can they ask their teachers for help? 
Are there other resources they can use? Can they work with someone who's better at them? They can show them, demonstrate, you know, group work can be beneficial. If someone, you know, you don't want the blind leading the blind, but if you partner with someone who's a little bit better, that can be beneficial to you. Um, and if you're nervous about math, sometimes the name of the game and you have anxiety is just a start. Um, when you have the amygdala firing and I'm nervous, I don't know what I'm doing. Once you begin to activate the frontal cortex, it actually starts to send some GABA back and calms down uh, the amygdala. Yeah, gamma amino butyric acid, GABA helps to make the amygdala less reactive. So when you actually begin to think and begin to work, begin to problem solve, that tamps down anxiety. That sense of like helplessness and I can't do anything. When you begin to do some work and, and problem solve, that quiets that part of the brain down. So again, if you're nervous, it's just, just start sometimes and then you, well, then you become less anxious. Um, find math affirming teachers. There's research, again, Baylock, we did all this big work about 10 years ago that kid teachers who are math anxious or don't like math, they develop kids who are math anxious. So the teachers matter, the parents matter. So it's not just the students, like, you know, they don't develop their beliefs in a, in a vacuum. Um, but there are many teachers, younger ones, you know, less trained who, if, if they have math anxiety, they can in, in, infect their kids essentially with that. So you want to give kids positive experiences, give them some successes. There is an idea, um, one of the great cognitive scientists of last century, um, Albert Bandura, gave us all this great research about anxiety and self-efficacy, self-concept, self-belief. That if you have an experience of yourself as more masterful, if you have some success, then you feel uh, more capable and you have less anxiety. So giving people some success makes them less anxious as they begin to, you know, that sense of efficacy mediates, um, you know, the, the level of anxiety. So if I can, uh, so again, you can read up on his cognitive theory, success increases efficacy beliefs, lowers anxiety. So you want to create successes and you may put them, you know, in a little bit easier math class or do something to make the challenge a little less daunting. They begin to feel like, oh, if I put forth effort, I see an outcome, more of that, please. Um, there's also some study, this is a little bit self-serving, but again, this is some of the evidence. Stanford School of Medicine did some one-on-one -on -one math tutoring, and they found that it made, it increased the performance in math, but the better part was, again, popping kids in the fMRI machine, it made the amygdala less reactive. And so after tutoring, the fear circuitry, the amygdala were no longer activated in kids who began self-reporting high math anxiety. So it actually diminished the level of anxiety. It wasn't just coping skills, but it, it stopped the, 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 the amygdala from being so responsive as a threat. And so cognitive tutoring can lower anxiety. That's pretty cool. That's from Vinod Menon. Vinod Menon. All right. Um, I also asked my tutors because, you know, I tutor some, but my tutors tutor more. And um, I, I promised the experts would speak, and I'm, I'm only one fraction of the expertise in, in outdoor tutoring. Um, and so Sarah Fletcher, I have to give her a shout out. She's a whiz at teaching math and she has like gender studies helping females and she's a math, you know, like master's in math. She's just so wicked smart. Um, and she's one of our experts. She writes a lot of our curriculum, but total math, math genius, I would say. Um, and she would say, you know, learning things can be challenging. If students struggling, acknowledging that struggle is a good thing, you know, is it, helping them, you know, frustration, you need some frustration tolerance. Um, it's okay. And so sometimes you're going to break things down totally fine. Um, but some struggle is totally great. Doesn't mean you aren't a math person again. Encourage kids, ask more questions. Again, some of them may have been shot down. They may have been told they were not good at this, but always encourage them to ask questions, to engage more, do more discourse, more dialogue, and train them to ask questions. Very important. And then work with, you know, your school, your kids' teachers. If kids struggling with math, depending upon how old they are, if they're a 10 versus 18, it's going to be different if they want to be doing more, more self-advocacy. Um, but there could be gaps and are there remediation, you know, other classes available, support available? Um, is there a possibility time factor is an issue? Can a kid get more time for math? Maybe they don't have a disability, but maybe talk to the school, depending upon how open they are to have kids needing more time. If they you know, haven't yet diagnosed a disability or processing speed deficit. Sometimes psyche balance costs a lot of money and if they don't have that, maybe they'll still work with you. Um, Eric Garb, also a great tutor, one of our paying tutors. And he says, you know, it's the scope of tasks. There's like, you know, he works with kids on higher level math and can I break things down? And he asks them, you know, what can I do right now? What do I know? And start there versus this whole, what do I not know? 
So have them start with, I know this, I know this, and break it down to smaller steps, and you build confidence as you start to you know, get concrete what I actually do know. Um, organized structuring. So he works with kids on Algebra 2, Pre-Cal and Calculus, and often they see it, and they're like, they're not getting it. And again, he says, train them on orderly, structured, really structure everything line by line. What do I know? What's the next step? So versus doing big math in our head. The more they get on the paper, the more they begin to make fewer careless errors, and the more they start to actually be able to solve problems. So more explicit, organized, write down everything. That's a one way to reduce math anxiety. Um, and validation, he's a big believer. Hearing students, uh, you know, always affirm them and talk about, you know, why it feels bad to do math. Um, you know, ultimately letting them talk that and, 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 and without judgment and so forth. So uh, another Chelsea, she's out in Seattle. Um, and she said, for some kids with anxiety, they're comparing themselves to their friends who are better or their siblings who are better. And this creates some competitive pressure um, to do it well. So in those cases, reframe it um, and minimize this need to compare to others and make the comparisons more self-comparative, self-reflective. Not, you know, how am I doing versus my older brilliant sister? But how am I doing versus myself? Am I making progress versus my, my, the quiz I had last week? Am I getting it better? Um, I'm, not, I'm not behind someone else. And that's very helpful. So this is a part, I'm going to dedicate about 10 minutes to this. I think it's so interesting. And I, I did some research on this about four, a couple of years ago on gender and math. And I think it is salient to this conversation. I think it's probably relevant. Um, and males and females often have different perceptions. And, and there is more math anxiety among females. So I think it is actually quite relevant for this talk. Um, males on average have higher perceptions of their math abilities, higher levels of math interest and enjoyment, higher math competency beliefs, stronger goal orientation in math, lower levels of math anxiety, um, and they have higher reputation among the strongest performers. And this matters because this matters tremendously on who's going forward to an engineering degree, who's going to a computer science degree, who's going to an engineering degree in general, who's going to finance, who's going to business and, and, and all these higher paying jobs. Part of the pay gap starts here. Part of the pay disparity, um, you know, it, it's all about this math differential. So if we can get this right, we can eliminate a lot of the differential of who makes more money in the US. Um, and there are some other choices, self-selection, but a lot of it start, starts from this career selection piece. So self-belief, self equity self from math. Boys and girls report similar confidence um, in elementary, but my middle school, boys start to deviate. Um, and their confidence seems to be independent of external feedback. Um, and then often, you know, girls believe they have to work harder than their males, uh, their male counterparts. And again, differences in self-efficacy beliefs can affect motivation and interest. So here's uh, you know, a little framing um, that over time, um, this perception of, you know, for math, self-efficacy. Um, for boys, it starts off, I'm good at math, I'm good at math. But then girls start dropping off of, I'm, I'm math's harder for me. And then in a similar fashion, boys start off in second grade, I like math. Ninth grade, uh, math interests me. But females start off with, I like math. By grade nine, I'm not interested in math as much. So we see these, these changes in self-concept, self-efficacy, and interest. And lower efficacy comes with higher anxiety. Um, so females report higher math anxiety. And by 15, many uh, girls are feeling anxiety about their ability to do math. Even when their math skills are on par with boys, they feel more anxious and less confident about their abilities. And this to me is, is pretty breathtaking. Like they're performing identically on standardized measures, on the PISA, on the other assessments, dollar, you know, question for question. However, the same performance as their male counterparts, they feel more anxiety and less confident, which again, that they might not take BC calculus, they might not go into an engineering major. And so part of it is telling females this. They're looking at different perceptions of how they're viewing their abilities and, and they're more self-critical. Um, and again, boys tend to exhibit more of a growth mindset. If I'm gonna get better, I, I'm gonna grow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. Um, and so the challenge is, you know, one says, I didn't put in enough effort, I can get better at this. And females may say, I'm not as good at math um, versus I have to take a different approach, try harder. So be, be thoughtful about these differences in attribution. Um, and this is Eccles and Wakefield. And their self-appraisals are often poorly calibrated. So they may get a 93% on a math assessment and say, I'm not very good at math, which is nonsensical. But again, their calibrations are off from their... So often I show females like their, their performance on standardized measures, like you're good at math. 
Um, but your perception is that you're not, and that's, that's, that's changing your belief. So Sean Baylock looked at, again, a teacher math anxiety. And so there wasn't a relation between the teacher's math anxiety and the student's math anxiety achievement at the beginning of the school year. But at the end of the school year, the more anxious teachers were about math, the more likely girls, but not boys, were to endorse the, the stereotype that boys are good at math and girls are good at reading, and the lower the girls' math achievement. So part of it is anxious teachers um, affect girls more than boys, which is really interesting. They're modeling, and often they're more female teachers, um, but they're looking at, you know, they're, they're norming themselves, their beliefs on their these models. Um, additionally, there's math teachers are prone to attributional gender bias. So if you have a female um, who's, you know, working really hard, they're saying, um, here we go. So if boys do well, it's ability. If girls do well, it's effort. But if boys are not doing well, it's lacking of effort. But if girls are not doing well, it's lack of ability. And that's, so, so we have these funny attributional things going on. So if the boys really give, oh, this is a math genius. If the boy has a, a C in math, oh, he's lazy. If the girl has an A, a 95 in math, she's a hard worker. If the girl has a C in math, she's not good at math. So the exact same performance, we say the boy isn't trying hard enough and we say the girl is not good at math. So we have some of, so again, teachers are so powerful. We need to some more instruction on this one. But you see how our kids can get thrown off course by the attributions of our teachers. So parents, be mindful. You're part of this too. If your daughter brings home a 75 in math, are you going to tell her you're not as good at math or tell her you have to try different approaches, strategies? Um, and, and would you tell your son something different if he came back with 75 in math? Like quit, quit screwing around versus your female, maybe you stick with reading. You're better at that. So again, these little subtle messages, our kids are picking them up. Um, there's also some more evidence. So success in math were attributed to effort more for girls than for boys, and failures in math were attributed more for effort than for the girls. And for high achieving kids, successes in math were attributed more to effort for girls than for boys. So again, this is that's that interesting study. I think. Um, and parents again have tremendous influence. Parents have higher expectations of math achievement for their sons and for their daughters. Ask yourself, is that you? Um, and stereotypes lead them to underestimate their daughter's math ability, but overestimate their son's math ability. Parents of boys also tended to overestimate their, their male child's science ability and interest. Parents encourage boys more strongly than girls to be involved in mathematics and science activities, robotics club, things like that. Um, so again, uh, parents, adolescents who perceive their parents as valuing math display more interest in math. Um, when mothers value math and science disciplines as useful, this affects kids' belief about the importance of math and achieving their goals. If parents have high expectations for their kids in STEM, they're more likely to have adolescents with high um, the same expectations. Sarah, my tutors who teach boys and girls, said females may second guess themselves and may have false low confidence in math. Um, you know, ultimately reinforce them. And I, I, so Sarah says, I openly talk about confidence and how it can improve performance over many times. So with your female student, with your daughters, talk about confidence openly and explicitly about the importance of confidence. Allison, a lot of girls that I work with tend to have a fixed mindset about their abilities and talents. While boys are frustrated by failure, um, they are going to be energized to try again. So the guys double down. The girls are going to be, ah, I'm not good at this. So talk to them. And if you see this, check it, correct it. Um, Cadenhead said, yeah, one of my kids with 32, she's good until she hits a math problem that's trickier. Then she says, I'm bad at math and I'm stupid. So again, check this, correct this, recalibrate this with your kids. Jana, um, one tactic I use is to redirect them when they apologize for getting a question wrong. I say, what are you sorry for? And often I'm sorry I wasted your time or asked me to repeat this. We then talk about, no, 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 learning takes time and mistakes are perfect, they're part of the process and you don't have to ever apologize for not understanding something immediately. So they'll correct it. Sarah Fletcher, again, our resident math genius. When I work with kids who are feeling discouraged in STEM fields, we do some myth busting, which some of them I saw earlier, that math um, doesn't, isn't part of the real world, or that, you know, if I don't get it immediately, I must be bad at these things. And also, like, you know, being good at STEM, you have to be willing to wrestle with material. It's part of getting better at math. Uh, and also, the, the myth of you're either a STEM person or humanities, which is nonsense. And these are false divisions. And there are plenty of folks who are, you know, 
the Natalie Portmans and the Maya Balak and then Hedy Lamar, you know, he, people who were great in the humanities and actors and also were very gifted scientifically. Um, Tal said, men are often entitled to make more mistakes and they're comfortable trying more difficult things. And females, you know, it reflects more on her intelligence and her worth versus it's a mistake. So again, with your, with your girls make mistakes, but it, you know, it's not a negative reflection upon you at all. It's part of learning. It's a growth thing. It's great. Um, Moriyama said, yeah, let girls and women make mistakes. Praise the mistakes. These are the root of science. They're deathly afraid of making mistakes because the room for error is virtually nil. Um, say congratulations, you know, discover new ways to, to make mistakes. And then we give them the agency to fail, fail big, and then try new things. Um, Sarah said, yeah, I'm an M&E major, and I mostly tutor girls in STEM subjects. I love working with girls in math and physics, and it's easy. Um, and so again, at the end, I said, you're good at math, and my, my female student just melted. That's a big part of my job. Um, and so ultimately, every female physics student I've ever worked with starts the first time saying, I have no idea what's going on. And by the end, you have to shake them and say, yes, you do. <laughs> so again, these are some interesting beliefs about the abilities and anxiety. And I don't think they lack confidence because they're told they're bad at math. Um, I think it takes is for them to be told that math is hard. Girls are socialized to be perfect and to avoid risks. We're not comfortable being in a class. We're not sure we're getting an A in. Um, and so I've taken a STEM class where the average test grade was below 70%. My heart would still sink when I scored in the 80s. And lastly, girls are supposed to make things seem effortless. Uh, and so when she took an AP physics calculus class and she wavered. Um, while I wavered, the guys in my classes seemed totally confident that they would become engineers. And I remember having an epiphany one day when I was studying with some of them and I realized, oh, they were every bit as clueless as I was. Um, you know, but for me, struggling meant I would never make it for them. Having struggled meant it wasn't a big deal. So again, this is a reframing, what is struggle? What is frustration? Is it part of the process or is it a reflection of I'm not good enough? Again, growth mindset versus fixed. And what they're all saying is we're seeing more of a fixed for females in math and STEM. So helping girls get to growth, helping them reframe it as part of our gift. Joe Bowler has a couple of good books. What's math got to do, got to do with it. And also mathematical mindsets, Francis Sue, Mathematics for Human Flourishing. Uh, all right, Apple Ruth Tutoring Services, we, where the science of learning comes together with the art of human connection. That's kind of my counseling and psychology and education, all the backgrounds together. That's where we are. We do academic tutoring, we do test prep. We help kids with coaching for executive functioning. If you want any help with those things, that's what we do. Um, and we have one more event in our mental health series. There've been several about technology, about friendship, social emotional learning. Next up is teens and anxiety. That's on the 31st. And I'll, I'll cover some of this content, but also more content. We also are helping kids with writing. If your kid needs help with math and writing. And of course, we help kids with math all the time. All right. I believe we have some time for some Q&A. How can we help? Any, any questions? Any feedback? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you liked it. Some good feedback from me there. Um, okay. Well, and there may not be questions, and which, which is okay. And we're going to send you a copy of this. So feel free to share it, play it for your kids. Hopefully it'll be beneficial, helpful. Talk to your kids about math whenever you can. Make math normal. Talk about your own anxieties. Give them some strategies. Encourage them to exercise and take care of themselves and get enough sleep, which are also just part of lowering anxiety and so forth. Um, all right. Well, I, I think we don't seem to have any questions, but I want to thank you all for being here. And again, look for a link soon and everybody have a great night.